Kia ora Church Fano and welcome to Grace at Your Place. Yeah, it's so good to have you with us today. And um, man, even though we've been going through a crazy season, we love to laugh a bit in our church family about um, what we're going through. And we've had to wear masks now more than ever, haven't we, Brooke? Yeah. In our church services and um, everywhere we go. And I don't know if you find this, but when you're wearing your mask, um, you can't really win because you have bad breath sometimes and you just sit in it and you're like, oh my goodness, oh. I never realised my bad breath was this bad. <laughs> but then when you put gum in, I put gum in the other day and it stung my eyes, like oh, the mints just stung my eyes. That is the worst. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Have you experienced well, anything? Well, the other day I had to sneeze while I was wearing my mask and I kind of <laughs> just panicked and didn't know what to do if I needed to cover my mouth and nose, which was obviously already covered by the mask. So oh. I just like sneezed in the mask and then was like, yeah, I think I should probably change this. <laughs> oh. And you know what else? Watching TV series on Netflix or things, I, yeah. I just find it really odd when you see the characters walking into a cafe or something and they're not wearing a mask and you're like, oh no, where's your mask? Or did you scan in? Or, yeah, yeah why, didn't they ca- why didn't they act to scan in? <laughs> like, they're, they're going to be traced. It's, yeah, um, we're it's- like... We're conditioned that we're in the mask zone. I we guess. really yeah. are. <laughs> and you know, it's a crazy time in history with the things that we're going through. My kids are growing up knowing that everyone's wearing masks. What a yeah, strange true. thing. But um, throughout all this, God's mission continues. Mm. And um, we can make light of some of these things and laugh together and be together today because we want to worship Jesus today. So in saying that, we've got someone from, from our team sharing with us in a minute. But why don't we pray? And Brooke, why don't you pray for us sure. to worship? God, I just thank you so much for this opportunity we have to um, come in together and worship your name. Um, we just thank you for your unchanging nature and um, the, the truth that you are sovereign over all. Um, yeah, we love you, Lord, and we pray this all in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. See you, everyone. Have a great day. Let's worship.
Well, welcome to Grace at Your Place. We are so thrilled that you've joined us today and we hope that you will have a great time and you'll hear directly from God. That's what's on our heart. We're in the middle of a series today uh, called Being Disciples and Making Disciples. And uh, we're gonna be pressing into that. Being disciples and making disciples is our mission statement as a church. And if you've missed the last couple of weeks and you haven't heard Dave and Liz share about being disciples, can I encourage you to go back and listen because there is some gold in the things that they're saying and you'll be really encouraged. And uh, you know, when you discover something amazing, usually, usually our human nature is that we want to share it with people around us. We become evangelists, whatever it is, whether it's the latest Netflix show that you're addicted to or the new diet that you've tried that works or something that you've bought. We all want to share what we have discovered. And it's because God has wired us like that. And He's wired us like that in order to share our faith as well. He's longing for us to discover the truth of who He is, and then share that with those people around us. That's what being disciples and making disciples really means. But you know, you can't be a disciple and make disciples and be fruitful in this if you get taken out by the enemy. And there is a battle going on for your soul. The battle is real. We're right in the middle of it. Peter talks about it in his letters to the early church. He says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. The enemy is real. He's on the hunt. He's looking for someone to devour. I'm not being dramatic in my language. Uh, It's what Peter has written in the Bible. Peter, one of the greatest heroes of our faith, who knew all about spiritual attack. These are Peter's words. He's like a hungry lion looking to devour you, looking to take you out. I'm gonna show you a little clip of a hungry lion looking to take someone out. Nice way to start for everyone. There he is, there's the lion and look at the little calf. It's all vulnerable. It's got no idea about what's just about to happen. There's the hungry lion on the prowl and watch out. Is anyone else's palms sweating? I'm gonna leave it to your imagination. Possibly the little calf's mum came along and like head butted the lion and they went away to safety and they lived happily ever after. You might like to think along those lines. Possibly something else happened and the little calf is no longer with us, but I'll leave it up to you to work out what you think happened. (laughs) Here is the thing. We can't be disciples or make disciples if we get taken out by the enemy. We need to take this seriously. C.S. Lewis said in his famous letters, uh, screw tape letters, he said, the general public either tend to think of the enemy as not being real. They kind of make fun of it. We draw cartoon characters of the devil and we don't think he's real. We play it all down. Or we go to the other extreme and we're looking for demons under every single stone. And, And neither of those are good approaches to take. But one thing is for sure, we need to take this seriously and we need to acknowledge that we are in a battle and the enemy is real and he's looking to make us vulnerable. He's looking to isolate us. He's looking to pounce. It's when we're isolated and when we're vulnerable and when we're away from everything that's familiar and our protection, that's when he can take us out. So what does spiritual attack feel like? Well, I think it often feels like pressure, pressure with no hope. That's what I'm coming to realise. I've been thinking about this quite a lot. It's the kind of pressure that makes you feel like giving up. I don't know, is anybody else feeling that kind of pressure at the beginning of this year? Is anyone else counting down the days till Christmas? (laughs) I've never done that before, but funnily enough, I am. Because Christmas represents holidays and being able to put another year behind you. And I'm kind of ready almost to put this year behind me. (laughs) Look, I know this stuff in my head, I know, I know the things in my head, but when you're in immense spiritual attack, when you feel like things are coming at you left, right and centre, 
your heart takes a pummeling. And I think many of us are experiencing that right at the moment. What are the hallmarks of the demonic? Fear, disunity, control, manipulation, deception. Those are all hallmarks of demonic activity. And there's a lot of that going on right now. And that's why everything feels so heavy. That's why it feels often like we're wading through concrete. Really does. It's why we feel like giving up. But it's actually good news. (laughs) Because it shows that the enemy is trying to stop us from what is coming next. And you know, I, I had this real encounter during my sabbatical last year that God is looking to do something new, that He's looking to pour out His Spirit in a whole new way, something that we haven't experienced before. But until we're in this battle to get there and the enemy doesn't want us to experience that and he's doing everything possible to cause disunity, to cause hopelessness, to get us to give up. The struggle is real. I was so encouraged last week um, when a friend gave me a word of encouragement. It was Paul Jack. He, he's on our core team for our 11 o'clock service. And he said to me, I just wanna encourage you with the story of um, Elijah and Jezebel. You can read about it in 1 Kings. And in this story, Elijah had had this massive showdown with the prophets of Baal. It's an amazing story. He had really shown them that God was in control. God had sent down fire onto his drenched offering. Uh, Elijah had then prophesied that there would be rain to end the three years of drought. Then he had run with the supernatural strength before the chariots of Ahab. the equivalent of a marathon to get back into town. Like that's quite significant running. It's sprinting really. He's sprinting in front of the chariots with their horses. And he gets back into town, all these miraculous things that he's been part of. And one word from Jezebel, Ahab's wife, literally takes him out. This one word is that uh, she said she was gonna kill him. And the thing that I've been thinking about is that Elijah had had many unpleasant words before. I'm sure the prophets of Baal weren't saying encouraging things to Elijah. He had heard these kind of things before, but he, there was like panic in his heart when Jezebel spoke that word to him. He went into hiding. He wanted to give up. He wanted to end his life. Why was that? It was because that word carried demonic power. And that's why it felt so devastating to Elijah. And that's why we find ourselves sometimes in these patterns where we just feel so discouraged and it doesn't make sense and we can't quite work it out. And in that moment, we need to recognise it for what it is. It's spiritual attack. If you feel like giving up, then I'm hoping to encourage you today. If you're feeling lukewarm, then I'm hoping, you to, I'm hoping for you to snap out of it <laughs> and realise that there is a battle and that we need to all take part in this. Because if you're feeling lukewarm, You don't realise what's going on around you. And it's your turn to stand up and fight on behalf of someone else who's feeling like they're gonna get taken out. There is fruit on the other side of the battle. If there weren't, there wouldn't be a battle. The fruit is real and it's going to be worth it. The thing about pressure, when we're feeling under enormous pressure, is that it actually does build character. And our faith is increased when we go through hugely pressurising seasons in our life. I had a little experience of that this week. On Monday, I went and did a class at my gym and uh, it was a different instructor. She looked, she looked um, harmless, actually. She was very enthusiastic. And I kind of thought, this is going to be easy. I put my little um, step onto the highest level thinking, oh, this is going to be fine. And then she literally killed me and I couldn't keep up with her. She was doing all these lunges over and over and over and my legs were literally shaking. I couldn't even control my legs as I was going down the stairs. And for the next two days, I could hardly walk, couldn't go up and down the stairs, thought I might have damaged my muscles. But then on the third day, sounds a bit spiritual, doesn't it? It wasn't spiritual, but on the third day after my class, uh, I did a strength class and I did my PB. I was like stronger and felt fitter than I've ever felt before. And it was just such a reminder to me that our muscles are made to be put under pressure. That's how they get stronger. It's the same with our faith. Our faith can take a lot of pressure. And it's when we feel like giving up, it's when we feel like we've damaged ourselves because it's been so hard 
that we're actually going, getting stronger. You've heard, that, you've heard that saying, no pain, no gain. It's true. Think about all the good things that come from extreme pressure. Giving birth, <laughs> that is extreme pressure. <laughs> there are many women in here who know all about that. Don't worry, I won't go into detail. But then you end up with this new life. It's worth it. Purifying gold, that's a highly pressurised process. Uh, think about even going through conflict in a relationship someone that you love and you go through conflict and you walk through it and it feels so hard, but you get to the other side of that and there is this beautiful intimacy. You're actually closer than you were before. Pressure actually builds character and it builds faith. So how do we handle this? How do we handle spiritual attack? I wanna talk about four things that we can do. The first thing is that we need to stay alert. That's what that verse from Peter says, stay alert. We need to wise up to the schemes of the enemy and recognise them for what they are. When we're feeling overly anxious, overly angry, overreacting about things, it could just possibly be a sign of spiritual attack. I've got another confession story to make to you actually about this last week. There was a lot going on in my world this last week, but it was Valentine's Day on Monday. We don't normally do a lot in our family on Valentine's Day, but this year I'd heard that my girls were going to do something special for me. So I thought I better up my game slightly. So I did go all out, bought beautiful cards, little gifts for my family. And it's been a bit of a busy old time actually in the Peas family. Um, Simon mentioned that John hasn't been well and that's taken a toll. And there's been a lot going on at church. And so there's a lot of pressure all around, but I felt very proud of myself for getting those little gifts and getting them all ready. One of my children might have said to me on that particular morning, oh, you got the wrong kind of gift. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I value honesty in my children, I really do. And I know getting the right gift is important, but I kind of went a little bit crazy. This is a confession you're probably going to think, I don't know why you're a pastor. I actually wondered why I was a pastor in that moment as well. Because I flipped out and uh, like everything that had been annoying me about this particular child came to the front of my mind and came straight out of my mouth. And it was like, how ungrateful you are. Like I've done all this and blah, 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 blah. And completely and utterly overreacted, said things I wish I hadn't said, even sent an angry text because I felt like I hadn't said everything I needed to say. It was bad. It was bad, bad, bad. And then, and then my son said to me just before I left for work, he was like, Mom, what's happening? <laughs> I was like, oh, and then the tears came. And I was like, I just feel under so much pressure. I just feel like I can't get anything right. And I'm trying my best and blah, 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 blah. And he was like, Mom, it's okay. And like, it's all good. And anyway, I left for work, lots of tears in the car, pulled myself together. And then halfway through my day, my lovely son came in with the biggest bunch of flowers you've ever seen in your life. And everything just melted away. I was just like, oh, I'm such a bad mom. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Send lots of happy texts and apologising. And... But you know, in that moment, what I realised was that was spiritual attack. There was so much going on and everything inside of me just wanted to give up. The enemy was wanting to cause disunity in the most precious relationships in my family. And I just let him ride right on in there and let him take control and wreak havoc over my family. And, uh, you know, I'm so grateful for my family wrapping around and for my son uh, taking positive action <laughs> because things were restored. But this is, this is what enemy warfare looks like. It's like pressure and pressure and pressure. And then suddenly you're just out of control, angry, and you're out of control, frustrated, just want to give up, can't do anything. That's spiritual attack. We need to be alert and stay alert and recognise spiritual attack for what it is. The second thing we need to do is we need to armour up. We need to get prepared. We need to put on our spiritual armour. I want to read with you uh, the passage that Paul wrote in his letter to the early church in Ephesus. He said, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on all of God's armour so that you'll be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. 
For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore put on every single piece of armour so that you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you'll be still standing firm. Stand your ground putting on the belt of truth and the body armour of God's righteousness. For shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. We put on our armour, not only for ourselves, but for those around us. The armour protects us, but it also protects those who can't protect themselves. It protects the vulnerable little calf in our lives. It protects our families when we put on the armour ourselves. It's a little bit like thinking about an army going to war. The, uh, The soldiers are sent out to a place to protect the civilians, often who don't know anything about the big picture. They're there, they can just see what's happening in their village or in their area. And the army are sent in, all armoured up with weapons to protect the civilians. The civilians don't have weapons, they don't have armour. The army does. God has sent us into this world. The civilians are the people that don't have a relationship with Jesus yet. They don't know the battle for their souls. They don't know the war that is waging on against them having eternal life. But we do. We're called to wear our armour for the sake of those who have no armour yet. We're called to put on the helmet of salvation, this covering over our minds. When we give our hearts to Jesus, we receive our salvation. And then we, are, we, we put on this helmet and it protects us from the lies of the enemy. The lies of the enemy are looking to take you out. That's kind of one of his key ways of attacking you, making you believe that someone thinks some, something, making you fall for offence and fear and all of those kind of things. It's the way that he keeps us locked. But we, we apply our helmet of salva- salvation to, to protect our minds, to usher in unity and trust. We're called to put on the belt of truth. It's so important to apply truth in this age that we live in of relative truth. The only truth is God's Word. God is truth. He is the Word. He is truth. And when you wear a belt, it's to stop your pants falling down, to stop you from leaving, leaving yourself exposed and vulnerable. Putting on the belt of truth does that in our faith. We're called to um, put on the breastplate of righteousness. It's a covering that goes over our heart. And Jesus was the only one righteous, able to stand before God. But because of what He did on the cross, He has made us all righteous as well. We all are clean before God because of this covering of righteousness that we have over our hearts. We're covered by His covering. We're called to put on the shoes of peace. That's what my Luke was doing on Monday when he came with that big bunch of flowers. He was putting on the shoes of peace and disarming the enemy. It's such a key thing for us to do. We're told to pick up the shield of faith. We actually have to physically pick it up. Everything else is on us, but we have to pick up and apply the shield of faith. See everything with the shield of faith. And then we pick up the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit is the only piece of weaponry, armour, that is actually there to attack. And the sword of the Spirit, N.T. Wright says, is not the whole of the Word of God. It's not the whole of the Bible. Actually, the translation and reading it, he's saying the sword of the Spirit actually means it's the Word of the Gospel that is our sword. It's our fighting sword. Whenever we proclaim the Gospel, we are attacking the enemy. Whenever we're sharing our testimony, we're attacking the enemy. Putting on the armour of God looks like getting prepared for battle recognising that the battle is going on all around us and actually getting prepared to take our place in the battle. That's what putting on the armour looks like. The battle is not against people. People may really annoy us. They may say hurtful things. Organisations may annoy us. Uh, but actually it's, it's spiritual powers that we're fighting against. 
It's the demonic forces at play. It's the powers and principalities that only God can see in the spiritual realm. That's what we're fighting against. We need to stay alert, we need to armour up and we need to do the stuff. Here's the thing, when you're in the army and when you're given your your armour and your weapons, you've got to stay fit. You, you then have to just train and train and train and train so that when the time comes for you to go into battle, you are ready. It's exactly the same with us. We've got to stay spiritually fit. We've got to keep on training. We can't rest on yesterday's spiritual experiences. We have to keep on keeping ourselves spiritually fit. Uh, Dave and Lizzie talked about this the last couple of weeks, about all the ways that we can do this. Reading the Bible We don't do it, again, to tick it off the list, to feel good about ourselves. We do it because it's a key way that we hear from God and He speaks to us through His Word. Don't have to read 12 chapters a day for that to happen. You can read one verse, but intentionally picking up the Bible and reading one thing every day is a way to apply the armour of God in your life. Coming to church, you're all doing that today. When we come to church, when we stand together with other believers, we are applying the armour of God. We are staying strong. We're keeping one another accountable. We're keeping one another fit. Your faith encourages me and hopefully my faith encourages you. That's what happens when we come together as the people of God. Giving thanks, thankfulness. It's such a key way to enter into the presence of God. That's another way of us armouring up and doing the stuff. Worshipping. Uh, spending time with Jesus. It's my favourite topic. I could talk for hours on intimacy with Jesus. It's because it's the thing that I've been discovering more and more in my life. Jesus invites us to come into His presence every day. Again, not for us to feel good about ourselves, like to do these great big intercessory prayers that were like, it's all right, God, I can help you out with this one. I'm just gonna pray and fast and it's all on me. It's completely the other way around. He's like, just come and sit in my presence and tell me what's on your heart (laughs) and let me... Uh, get the whole of heaven's armies on, on side with you so that we can do something together. He is so good to us. We need to spend time in His presence just like we need to breathe. We, we, this is, when we spend time with Jesus, it's where we get our instructions for the day. If we want to be effective in anything we do, it all comes out of a place of spending time with Jesus every day. It's one of the key ways that we stay spiritually fit and we stay on target and we stay trained and ready. These are the hallmarks of being a Christian. And when we do them regularly, even when we don't feel like doing them, we're getting fit. It's like we're forming neural pathways in our brain so that then when when it really matters, we just automatically step into those things. Telling our testimony is such an important thing to do. When is the last time you shared your testimony with someone? We all have different versions of our testimony, don't we? We have the one minute awkward version where we suddenly feel like, I need to tell them that I'm a Christian and everything's going through our head. What shall I say in a nutshell? I've got literally one minute to share my faith. Or we've got the longer version of our testimony when someone's actually genuinely interested and we've got time and we know them. Sharing our testimony is one of the ways that we overcome the enemy. It's like, it's a counterattack move. It's the spirit, the sword of the spirit. It says in Revelation 12 that that they defeated Him by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. The enemy is eventually defeated through what Jesus did on the cross and us giving glory to Him for what He did on the cross, sharing our testimony over and over. Not just the testimony of when we first came to faith, but the testimony of what He did in our lives last week or last month or a few years ago. So stay alert, armour up, do the stuff and finally stand firm. Don't give up, stay your ground. Persevere, don't be tempted to throw it all in. The battle is worth it. There is eternal treasure at stake. We're literally fighting for other people's eternal souls when we're in this battle. There is a cost, but it is so worth it. We might, we might not actually see the results ourselves here on earth, but we can trust God with the results. He knows what He's doing. He knows why He's positioned you in the family and on the mission fields where you are right now, your workplace, your flatmates, your community. All of those details are very important to God. He has, 
handpicked you for a special mission field. And there are people's eternal souls at stake. And you can take up your place in the battle. And the encouragement today is to stand firm. Don't give up, don't run away from the battle. There is story upon story of the fruitfulness coming after the battle. When people persevere and they stay, they stand firm. Think about Joseph. Joseph was given this incredible prophetic word as a young man and then he spent the majority of his life in prison. And each time he was in one scenario, God really blessed the people around him and then he moved to another scenario and God blessed the people around him. And finally, he ended up being the 2IC to Pharaoh, feeding the whole of the people of the land through a time of famine. Incredible mission field, but it came at such a cost. Joseph's name actually means, may God increase. God brought increase wherever Joseph set foot. Think about Daniel. Daniel was removed from everything he knew, everyone he knew and taken into exile as a young man. Everything in his life was stripped away, even his name. And yet he ended up uh, serving three influential kings at the time and bringing so much glory to God through the way that he served. His faithful obedience is miracle upon miracle in Daniel's life. Think about David. He was handpicked as a young shepherd He was told he was gonna be the next king and then he spent all those years running away from King Saul who was trying to kill him. But David is credited as being one of the greatest kings of all time. And he was known for having a heart for God. His heart was on fire for God. He was an incredible leader. He was known for his love for God and his love for people. God used him powerfully. Think about Naomi. Naomi was Ruth's mother-in-law. She lost everything. She lost her husband. She lost her two sons but she persevered, she didn't give up. She passed on her faith to her daughter-in-law, Ruth, who then played a key part in Jesus' family tree. Story after story of people being stretched beyond anything that they thought they could endure and God using them powerfully. Don't give up. Think about Jesus Himself. He modelled what it was to be permanently under spiritual attack. Every story you read is a struggle because every person ordained to do significant things for God is in a battle. Each one of you is ordained to do significant things for God. Did you know that? It's not just like this magic leadership touch that people get. Every single one of us, when we give our hearts to Jesus, He's got plans and purposes for you. He's longing to touch so many people through your faithful witness. And it's worth it. We're told in 2 Corinthians, Sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. No eye has seen, no mind can imagine the things that God has in store for those who love Him. We can't even begin to imagine it. This earth is gonna pale into insignificance in comparison to what He's inviting us to. It's worth it. You're in a battle right now. How will you respond? Stay alert. Recognise that there is a battle and it's taking place. Armour up not just for you, but for those around you. Do the stuff, get it done, stay spiritually fit, use your weapons and stand your ground. Don't give up, keep on going. It's actually all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. The enemy tries to cause so much distraction and chaos and pain and fear. And we can so easily take our focus off Jesus but we need to keep our eyes firmly on Jesus. And in the midst of those attacks, when you feel like your head is hung low and you feel like giving up, you feel like it's not worth it. That is the very moment that you need to catch Jesus' gaze. And if you can't do it on your own, that's where you need to come together with other people who will encourage you and help you to do that. Don't get taken out in this battle. I wanna end by reading this uh, passage from Hebrews, it's from the message version. Do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blazed the way, all these veterans cheering us on, it means we'd better get on with it. Strip down, start running and never quit. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus who began and finished this race we're in. 
Study how He did it because He never lost sight of where He was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way, cross, shame, whatever. And now He's there in the place of honour right alongside God. When you find yourselves flagging in your faith, go over that story again, item by item, that long litany of hostility He ploughed through. That will shoot adrenaline into your souls. I'll just end by sharing this. You know, one of my privileges in my job is that I get to be with people when they're given a uh, terminal diagnosis. Often one of the, we're often one of the first people that people will phone when they're dealing with that kind of news. It's such a privilege in my job to walk people home. And you know, when you're given a terminal diagnosis, things come into sharp focus. You really know what's important. And in that moment, it's not important about what you drive or where you live or what the scales say or what your body looks like. None of that stuff is important. What's important is your faith. Where are you going when, when these days on earth are finished? And what about the people around you? Are your relationships intact? Do the people around you know how much you love them? Have you left the kind of legacy that you feel proud of, that God would be proud of? That's what becomes important. It's like this divine moment that I see people step into. And it's so beautiful when people have faith because although it's really painful saying goodbyes, they know where they're going. We're invited to live like we're dying as Christians to focus on the important stuff, to not get taken out by all of the shiny distractions of this earth, but to focus on what's important. Because we know one day our days on this earth will draw to a close. And sometimes we know that a little bit more ahead of time when you know those days are running out. But we're invited to focus on what's important and it's actually all about Jesus. That's what's important. Can I invite you to stand? We're gonna pray together. Jesus, I ask that we would catch your gaze right now in this moment. Thank you for reminding us of what's at stake. Thank you for being clear in your word about the spiritual battle that is taking place all around us. Thank you for your encouragement of how we can stay in the battle and what we need to do to keep safe. And Lord, I pray that today you would speak clearly to your people about exactly where they're at and what their next step needs to be. God, I pray that You would give us eyes to see the spiritual realities of what's happening around us, that we would recognise spiritual attack for what it is and then invite You in, Jesus. God, I pray that You would show us how to armour up. I pray that You would show us how to get and stay spiritually fit, Lord. If there's an area in our life where we know we've been slipping, Lord, would you uh, just give us a desire to get that sorted out? Put people around us who would help us with that. Give us courage to be vulnerable, to actually name it for what it is and to ask for help when we need it. And Lord, I pray that you would give us a fierce determination to not give up, God. For those who are feeling like quitting right now, for those who are feeling so discouraged, God, would you just come in and remind us all again that it's worth it. Would we catch your gaze and remember why it's worth it, God? I pray that we would, uh, we would stand up together as your people for such a time as this and make a difference in our nation in your name, Jesus. That we would be known as Christians for how we love you and how we love one another. That we would speak that we would not fight against flesh and blood, but that we'd be fighting against the spiritual powers and principalities that are holding people hostage, God. Show us how to do that. Show us how to pray, Lord, and how to warfare in prayer, God. Show us how to keep our hearts clean and clear before You, God. I ask that You would make us effective in Your Name, Jesus. Amen. Thanks for watching today. Be blessed this week and uh, get in touch via our website if there's any information that you need. Ka kite anō.